Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Many people consider the Space Shuttle to be their favorite launch vehicle, and it's not hard to see why. It always carried a crew into space. It had you know, fairly substantial lift capabilities. It was able to deploy satellites, and it was able to actually rendezvous with satellites, service them, and sometimes bring them back to Earth. And when the Space Shuttle was landing, it looked pretty good doing it. All in all, the Space Shuttle had a lot of different capabilities that we haven't seen since. And yet, over its 100 plus mission career, the Space Shuttle only launched three interplanetary missions. This was Magellan, Galileo, and Ulysses. And many people don't actually notice this because during the 1980s, the US didn't launch any interplanetary space missions until right at the very end. The US government didn't approve any new missions between 1978 and 1990. And again, people didn't notice because in 1977, the US had launched a pair of spacecraft called Voyager and Vo Voyager 1 and 2, right? And those periodically flew by one, some planet and provided us amazing images and new insights into the solar system, distracting everyone from the fact that the US wasn't launching anything. And it's notable that in 1986, when Halley's Comet swung through the inner solar system and the Halley Armada of spacecraft left Earth to investigate this comet, five spacecraft from three different countries, Japan, Europe, and Soviet Union, the US was not among them. Instead, the US found an old spacecraft which had been sitting at the L1 point between the sun and the Earth. And a genius astrodynamicist figured out how to swing it around the moon and kick it off into an orbit to encounter Halley. That was what the US was able to bring to this uh, you know, life, once in a lifetime achievement. So the three missions that did launch in the space shuttle, Magellan, Galileo and Ulysses, they kind of launched in the reverse order that the scientists originally envisaged. Galileo and Ulysses had been in development before the space shuttle launched and they were in always intended to launch on the space shuttle. They were actually getting ready to launch in May of 1986. Within like a week of each other, they would both launch. And of course, at the start of 1986, the Challenger disaster happens and that grounds the space shuttle, changes everything. The, the spacecraft go back to their, you know, integration, you know, whatever, their facilities. And the mission designers have to redesign because there's changes to what's going to be possible and also changes to the planned trajectories because they're going to miss their launch windows. Magellan, on the other hand, it started slightly later and it actually ended up launching first because when they did figure out its launch date, it was going to be in 1989, pretty much at the same time as Galileo, and they didn't want that to interfere with Galileo's launch since it had already been sort of kicked down uh, its timeline a fair amount. But like on top of just delaying everything, Challenger disaster also meant that the space shuttle was no longer required to be a launch vehicle for every single payload. NASA, you know, NASA opened up the opportunities for other launch vehicles. And so by 1992, when Mars Observer launches, it flew on a Titan and there was no other interplanetary launches on the space shuttle because it didn't really make that much sense as a launch vehicle. Another effect of Challenger was that they were planning to use uh, an upper stage called the Centaur G. This was a version of the Centaur hydrogen oxygen upper stage, which still flies today on uh, Atlas. And this would enable the space shuttle to throw the payloads much further and faster than the interim upper stage, which had been developed for payloads up to that point. So like the space shuttle flies up to low Earth orbit, and it can just you know, deploy satellites out of its payload bay there. But if they have to go up to geostationary orbit, they need to be attached to a booster that will carry them up there. So they developed the interim upper stage, which is a two-stage solid rocket motor. They would basically kick this out of the cargo bay or the payload bay, retreat to a safe distance, light that first stage, kick the spacecraft up into the geostationary transfer orbit. And when it reached geostationary orbit, they would relight or light the second engine and that would circularize the orbit and that would deploy the satellite. So this was called the interim upper stage and it was solid rocket motor. It was quite capable, but it wasn't quite capable enough for what they needed to for, for Galileo. They actually looked at building a three stage version of the IUS for Galileo. And when the money or the funding got 
larger than they expected. They decided to go with Centaur G and Centaur G Prime, which would be slightly bigger. Now, the Centaur wasn't just a NASA thing. The Air Force was interested in using it for its spacecraft and its satellites. Um, the, the Centaur G could do some smaller payloads, like uh, Magellan would be one example, and the G Prime would be needed for Galileo and Ulysses. Now, the size of the Centaur was also was quite expansive because it needed to have this large low density hydrogen tank. It also ended up being quite near the mass limits of the space shuttle. And to do this, they expected to actually have to run the engines at 109% throttle, <laughs> right? They also expected to use a, an extra light, a lighter external tank so it could get there. And they would cut the crew down from seven to four. Also because hydrogen is a cryogenic liquid and boils off, the tank or the fuel tank sitting inside the payload bay is going to be constantly venting off hydrogen and oxygen, which needs to be dealt with. But that meant also when it got to orbit, it was constantly losing propellant. So they wanted to have it launched within the first day so that they maximized the performance. And in turn, that meant the four shuttle astronauts that would be assigned to it would all have to have previous shuttle experience and all have to have shown that they did not suffer space sickness in any way so that they would be able to perform this mission within the timing required. So anyway, Challenger, of course, means that the risk that NASA is wanting to take sort of get dialed back quite a few notches, so Centaur is no longer a possibility. And the interim upper stage becomes the permanent upper stage. So instead of changing the acronyms and all the documentation, it becomes the inertial upper stage. Therefore, they don't need to change all those IUS references and all the checklists and publications. Okay, so let's talk about the missions. First of all, Magellan, the first one to fly, right? Again, the last one of the missions to actually get approved for development. So Magellan's mission was to map the surface of Venus using synthetic aperture radar. And it wasn't the first mission that was slated to do this. The first one was called the Venus Orbiting Imaging Radar, or VOIR. And that began development in the late 1970s and progressed for a couple of years and then was cancelled by Congress in 1982. But a year later, JPL came back with a much less ambitious and much cheaper Magellan mission. So how did they save money? Well, firstly, they eliminated all the non-radar in scientific instruments. Secondly, they eliminated the second radar antenna. Originally, the VOIR spacecraft would be able to scan the surface of Venus with radar and simultaneously uplink the data through a separate antenna to Earth. But Magellan would only have one antenna. It would scan Venus when it was passing low, and then when it moved out to a greater distance, it would orient itself towards Earth and downlink that data back to Earth. So this had a huge impact on how much science Magellan could possibly downlink. But even more creatively, Magellan was basically built out of spare parts and test hardware for other missions, right? So the main spacecraft bus, the thrusters, and the high gain antenna all came from the Voyager spacecraft, right? Lots of the avionics and power systems were built for Galileo, and there were even parts from Mariner 9, Ulysses, the space shuttle, all integrated together by a cut price contractor to make a cheap spacecraft. For testing, they even borrowed parts from the Smithsonian Museum. There was an antenna dish on display from the Voyager program, and they borrowed this dish so they could test it before putting it back. That's what they had to do to get a space mission funded in the 1980s. So Magellan was carried to space on board the space shuttle Atlantis in May of 1989. It was mated with an inertial upper stage for the, which would drive it on its course to Venus. Unlike the spacecraft which would go to geostationary orbit, the first and second stage of the IUS were lit in quick succession to ensure they maximized the Oberth effect. It took the long way around the sun and arrived at Venus in August of 1990. From there, it began mapping the surface using radar for a few years. Its radar stopped working after uh, a few you know, mapping cycles, and then they continued to track it to, to do uh, gravimetric surface uh, studies of Venus. Towards the end, they tested aerobraking and other technologies, but it eventually burned up in 1994. 
So the next mission that was launched on board the space shuttle was Galileo, and it had begun developing in the late 1970s. Before Voyager had even encountered Jupiter, NASA had been developing plans to place an orbiter around Jupiter to investigate it and its systems. Now, it, uh, it basically went through many iterations before they arrived at the final spacecraft. At one point in 1981, Congress was trying to cancel the mission but the Air Force actually stepped in asking for the mission, you know, in support of the mission, which you might find strange, right? But the Air Force were actually really interested in what NASA was doing in terms of spacecraft autonomy and radiation hardening. These were capabilities that the Air Force wanted for their own satellites. So if NASA could spend some money developing these technologies for a spacecraft which would be out on its own near Jupiter, they were quite happy to support that. And so Galileo was saved from cancellation. Uh, the spacecraft would have to be uh, would have to be powered by radio isotope thermoelectric generators because it was going out to the Jupiter system, and the original plan was to place it on a Centaur G prime, which would be able to boost it directly out to Jupiter, potentially with an encounter with an asteroid on the way, and there it would spend a lot of time you know studying Jupiter. However, of course, as we know. Challenger happened and it was delayed. It was sent back to JPL and plans changed. So without the Centaur, they had to figure out a new way of getting the spacecraft to Jupiter. And that inertial upper stage simply didn't have the capabilities to do this. So they talked through a number of different possibilities and ultimately they came up with an, an astrodynamic trick where they would have the Venus Earth Earth gravity assist. They do, would swing it by Venus, then by Earth, and then make a small trajectory correction, and then the final Earth encounter would kick it off towards Jupiter. And honestly, that kind of set the blueprint for many future missions. That's how we launch missions to Jupiter and Saturn these days, because you know multiple encounters is much more efficient in terms of the launch vehicle capabilities if your spacecraft can handle it. Now, of course, one of the problems that did happen with Galileo was the failure of its main antenna. It had been shipped back to JPL, it had been moved around the country, it had been kept in storage from way longer than intended, and its antenna, which had been nicely folded up when they tried to unfold it after a while in space, the antenna got stuck and they couldn't get it to open. So the spacecraft wouldn't have a way to talk to Earth once it was all the way out to Jupiter they switched the spacecraft back to the smaller antenna that was on board and that was fine they were able to talk to it but initially they thought they were only going to be able to get about 10 bits per second data rates back from Jupiter. They were able to improve on this quite a bit. First of all they upgraded parts of the deep space network to improve the collection capabilities and noise. They added onboard software on the spacecraft to compress data before sending it back and they added some the ability to like choose data on the spacecraft to only send the important bits back and they pretty much saved the mission. That being said, there was a number of things that Galileo could have done that didn't do because of this antenna. They really wanted to look at Jupiter's atmosphere at really high you know, temporal, high rates, right? They wanted to make movies of the clouds in Jupiter's atmosphere and they simply didn't have the bandwidth to do this so they had to leave that behind. So yes, Galileo launched on board Space Shuttle Atlantis in October of 1989. It was deployed from the payload bay, it used both of the stages of the IUS in quick succession, headed for Venus, then swung by Earth, swung by Earth again, and then headed off to Jupiter. On the way, it passed two asteroids, Ida and Gaspra, and it discovered a moon around Ida, which was the first asteroid with a moon that we found. And of course it went and found a whole lot more at Jupiter before the mission was finally terminated in 2003 with Galileo being intentionally crashed into Jupiter to prevent it crashing into one of the other moons of Jupiter and potentially contaminating it. Finally, the Ulysses spacecraft. This was a spacecraft which went to study the Sun. Originally this started out as the International Solar Polar Mission and it was going to be a US spacecraft and a European spacecraft both flying over the poles of the Sun at the same time providing a full three-dimensional look at the Sun. You see we on the Earth we orbit around the Sun we can see the Sun at different angles during the year but we can never get up over the top of the Sun because it's very hard to get there. 
to get out there, uh, Ulysses was going to use the, a, the, a gravitational assist at Jupiter, which would kick its orbit up out of the plane to do this. So as I said, it was originally planned as this international mission between uh, Europe and the US, both launching their own spacecraft. But again, early 1980s, the mission gets cancelled by the US, leaving Europe still to do it. Now, the US was still committed to launch this, and they, they main, maintained that part of it. But yeah, Ulysses was reimagined. They took some of the instruments from the US spacecraft, put it on the European spacecraft. And again, they were ready to launch using a Centaur G Prime as its launch booster uh, vehicle in uh, 1986. Challenger delayed it, and they had to go back and reconsider things. So even with the IUS, they would not be able to kick the spacecraft up towards Jupiter, but they chose a different route. Instead, they took the two-stage IUS and added a third stage of a, a PAM-S. That's a payload assist module, which was used for some smaller spacecraft. It was basically a Star 48, and that's a spin-stabilized booster. So I actually have the Lego model of this because it was a very limited edition. Uh, the idea is this is your two-stage booster here, and this is your uh, PAM booster on top, and this of course the tiny little spacecraft on top, which was a spin-stabilized uh, spacecraft which would fly past Jupiter and uh, ultimately over the top of the Sun. So Ulysses would be launched in October of 1990 on the Space Shuttle Discovery. It used the three stages on its uh, propulsion system to kick it off into a direct transfer to Jupiter. In fact, it was the fastest departure from Earth of any spacecraft until New Horizons many, many years later. So about six months later, in February of 1992, Ulysses encounters the massive planet of Jupiter and exploits its gravitational field to twist its orbit up over the poles of the Sun, far out of the ecliptic. And as it falls back, it is now able to see the sun in a new light, examine those polar regions for their magnetic fields. They understand now that the sun's solar magnetic field is different than we expected. Also, during this orbit, it spent a lot of time away from the sun because it was like a six year orbit. And it also was exceptionally useful for helping to locate gamma ray bursters in space because it was the only spacecraft that was outside of the plane of the elliptic, ecliptic which had a gamma ray uh, detector. So by triangulation, they were able to much more accurately and quickly locate gamma ray bursters on the sky. But the Ulysses mission ran for until 2009 when the spacecraft finally was shut down. And that was the end of the space shuttle missions that had been, or missions that had been launched from the space shuttle. And so, yeah, I want to stress that like the end of these interplanetary missions flying on the space shuttle was really because NASA stopped requiring these missions be launched on the space shuttle. Suddenly, the engineers and scientists could choose a more appropriate launch vehicle, which could do more for less money. And from the 1990s, the US returned to its place of prominence in the world. It became leading launcher of planetary science missions, while you know, former powerhouses like Russia sort of faded away and you know, Europe did its thing, but the US definitely cemented itself as a world leader in this field. The space shuttle would, of course, go on and find its niche and do what it did best. After launching the Hubble Space Telescope, it would save the day by servicing the Hubble Space Telescope and fixing the problems. It was the entire, it was the main reason why we can build the International Space Station and do a lot of the stuff that was required to build such a complicated structure in space. So sure, the shuttle sucked at launching interplanetary space probes, but it was still awesome. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.